Appreciate you having me. Excited to be back here in Bexley. We figured out that I spoke about Columbus Food Truck Cookbook in 2017, so it's been a minute. Um, and we're gonna do this very fluid. You guys are welcome to ask questions as I go through. You can stop me, you can you know, talk about other books, totally open. Uh, I've got a little presentation prepared and that will help our friends on the live stream. Um, but you know, again, feel free to interrupt as we can keep this conversational. So hi, I'm Renee and I love ice cream. Uh, the dedication in this book is actually written to my mother who I, I grew up in Chicago and she claims that we went for ice cream every single day after preschool, even in the dead of Chicago winter. She also did not shy me or keep me away from what I'll call the hard stuff. I went straight for chocolate, not kids save vanilla. Um, and maybe that's why we went in winter because at least it couldn't drip as, as badly down you know, all of me. I now have two three-year-olds, they're almost four, they will tell you, um, twins, and I take them for ice cream and it's basically just a cleanup project. All of my daughters actually also, I have three total, uh, still order their favorite flavor based on color which can be a little challenging because I don't really like things that taste like purple, and that's one of the twins' favorite color. I will say our friends at Handles up in Powell do a grape, which is very difficult to find. Usually the closest she can get is like a black raspberry chip at Graders or something like that. Um, the oldest one, who is about to be eight, she is in the super moon, blue moon, cotton candy-ish phase of life. She's just progressing from little girl pink being her favorite color uh, to light blue being her favorite color. And so apparently she has just decided to combine her ice cream preferences. Also not a big fan of those flavors. Now the, the last one will order um, green ice cream, which tends to be mint chocolate chip. And so I'm willing to lick her cone. They were all fantastic taste testers during the process of writing this book. Uh, coming off of the Columbus Food Truck Cookbook, which is a little bit different because it is a cookbook. So it shares the story of the trucks and kind of why they do what they do, how they got their start, um, but alongside one to three recipes from each truck. We actually followed that up with a book called The Best of Trailer Food Diaries. The Columbus Food Truck Cookbook was part of the Trailer Food Diary series, but it didn't have that same name because our publisher felt that trailer food had a bit of a different connotation in the Midwest. So we went with the simpler, much longer, um, a very long URL, but ju just the ColumbusFoodTruckCookbook.com. Um, and it was very well received, so we re-implemented it in with the Trailer Food Diary series, which had nine books at the time, so that was the 10th, and it's called The Best of Trailer Food Diaries. And that uh, features three books on Austin, Texas, two books on Portland, Oregon, one book on Dallas, and one book on Houston. And if you've been to any of those cities, you know that they are food truck meccas. A lot of people think that food trucks really got their start. Somewhere on the West Coast, there's some controversy over whether it's LA or Portland, but Austin lays claim to quite the food truck scene. Um, and when I relocated here in 2014, we had gone from 40 to 400 trucks in Columbus in four years. So basically from 2010, to 2014, there was just this incredible boom of mobile food. And I was very intrigued by it because as a Chicagoan, I went back home for 10 years post-college at Ohio University. Um, and it, at the time, at least, this has changed a bit, you weren't allowed to cook anything on a food truck in Chicago. So we ended up with about 400 cupcake trucks and no actual food. Uh, and there was actually another ordinance based on the bars and restaurant owners who have a pretty strong hold there in the city at least, that you could not have a mobile food operation within 100 feet of a bar or restaurant in the city of Chicago proper. If you've ever been to Chicago, good luck finding 100 feet of real estate where there's not a bar or a restaurant. So it really had hindered the mobile food scene. And coming to Columbus and, and relocating and really learning the neighborhoods in the city. My husband's from the Northwest Columbus, kind of upper Arlington-ish area. Um, so he was you know, familiar with that. But even since he'd gone to college in those 15 years of being gone, everything had changed so dramatically. And I think the restaurant scene specifically, led in large part by the mobile food scene, had just gone leaps and bounds from sort of your uh, run of the mill. What was the one you said earlier that your husband thinks is the high end, the Golden Corral? Yeah, no, but truthfully, like, 
those were the options for a long time, right? Applebee's, Golden Corral. I mean, you had Max and Hermes, which got its start here. So you had some inklings, but now you're seeing so many different types of cuisine, so much representation um, of where people are from and what foods they're bringing here. And so that was just a really um, amazing topic for me to kind of get my feet wet. So when I said I worked in advertising, I was actually an account person. I never even touched the creative side of things. They would be like, you can leave now while we go do the creative part. But I wrote uh, just for fun on the side. Like I would write recaps of my husband and I's travels for my mother. I had an audience of one. Um, and so she'd be like, they're just, they're so amazing. I feel like I'm there. And I'm like, yes, but you're my mom. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that really was kind of, it planted the idea that I would enjoy writing. And when I came to Columbus, I had an opportunity to write for what was then Columbus Crave magazine. It later got rolled into the dispatch, into the dining section. Um, but at the time, we had our own publication, and it was quarterly. And I started writing in the special advertising section. Advertising on the resume, we'll let you try your hand here. Um, and that got me enough credibility to actually approach the author of the Trailer Food Diary series tell her a little bit about what was going on here in Columbus in the mobile food scene, and you know, ask if she wanted the opportunity to bring her book, her series, East. It was serendipitous timing, uh, because her publisher, who is now my publisher, Arcadia and the History Press, had actually just uh, declined a project continuing the series because she didn't have in-market presence. She was looking to do San Francisco. She had done all the research, and they said, yeah, we don't think we're going to publish that book because you can't be there to promote it. And that's really something that Arcadia and the History Press feel strongly about. They want local authors, subject matter experts, to be able to have these conversations with people that are interested in these topics in you know, the places that they're about. And so when I had reached out to Tiffany, she said, this is a way to continue the series, having Renee there in Columbus. And to be frank, they took a huge chance on me, but I learned a ton through Tiffany in that process. And then they were the ones that came back afterwards to say, do you have interest in doing another book, and would you like to write about ice cream? Needless to say, three-year-old Renee in the car after preschool said, yes, please, and jumped up and down and said, how much ice cream do I get to eat in this process? I was also pregnant with twins, so we checked all the boxes. Um, and you know, this book came to me, actually, in another stroke of serendipity, because the original woman that was working on the project, she had an outline. She hadn't really done any writing yet, but she'd been doing some research about why Ohio has so many famous ice cream makers. And really, it's because we were one of the largest, if not the largest, dairy state. We had over 2,000 dairy farms at a certain point in Ohio's history. So that really led nicely into what do we do with all this milk? Like, we can drink so much of it. We can make cheese. Um, but you know, where, when the technology became available, freezers and whatnot, uh, we were one of the first to really start making ice cream. And we've got this long legacy. We've got generational families that are owners of businesses like the Graders. Um, even the Johnsons are on their third uh, generation of ownership. Velvet Ice Cream out in Utica. They're on their about to be fifth, is sixth is generation, um, passing it down, getting more of the family that are coming out of college now involved. And so um, she had written the outline, but she moved to Chicago. And she didn't want to you know, proceed with the project. They knew she wasn't going to be in the market when the project would launch. And they said, you know, funny enough, you guys just kind of switched places. But do you want to take her outline? She's willing for you to throw it up in the air if you want to. But actually, it was a great baseline to start from because she knew more of, um, I would say, the other markets than I necessarily did. Now, my husband covers the full state as a salesperson. So I'd been certainly to not just the you know, other seas, but to a lot of the smaller towns in between. Um, and that's something we really wanted to do is to represent not just the household names that we've talked about already, and of course Jenny's being on that list for sure, but we wanted to represent the mom and pop shops and the roadside stands that are only open from Memorial Day to Labor Day and are the cornerstone of their communities. So we'll talk a little bit about those as well. Um, but that was really part of my process. I, I alluded to the taste testing, and I certainly started with this outline. Um, and then I crowdsourced. I went on social media and I said, hey guys, give me you know, Ohio Network or those that are Ohioans but are somewhere else now, give me your favorite Ohio ice cream place. 
And I, there's four pages of honorable mentions at the back of this book because I got so many suggestions. People, you know, you have a favorite ice cream place. You have a favorite ice cream place. Like you grew up with something in your town and it tastes, it's a taste memory. You go back for the same thing year after year, um, especially if there's the scarcity of them not being open year round. And so those were the really fun ones to dig into. I'm not gonna say that all of them were very marketing savvy to understand like, well, what do you, why do you want me to be in this book? And I'm like, it's free for you to participate. You really just have to give me an hour of your time to interview you. Ideally, you have some photography that isn't like, you know, just you're taking, actually phones are fine now, but some print ready photography is always very helpful. Um, and so some people don't respond and that's okay. Um, but a, a lot of people jump at the opportunity to tell their story and, and uh, you know, have it be shared in a way that captures it. Um, and that's really the impetus of the publishers to capture this kind of history and these legacies and not let that chapter of Ohio um, be left behind without telling that story. So from there, the project got the green light in, let's see, we're in 23 now. This would have been June of 21. And the publisher said, OK, you've got the go ahead. Do what you will with it. And I took that summer to do a lot of that research, to do some traveling, to do some taste testing of my own. Um, and then really to reach out to folks and say, you know, raise your hand if, you, if you'd like to participate. Of course, that's their busiest time of the year. So there was a lot of, yeah, we want to participate, but can we talk in the fall? Um, and especially the ones who closed down after Labor Day were like, we'd love to be there, but it's not going to happen until October. So things got a little chaotic, you know, come fall when I was getting into the holiday season family-wise, and I'm trying to kind of gather the loose ends. But I, uh, my deadline was about the middle of December to have a manuscript written. And typically a manuscript, at least for most of Arcadia's titles, are between 35,000 and 40,000 words. That's kind of what you commit to for the publisher. Uh, we could have gone on much longer. We could have written about many more shops. Um, we ended up with a little over 20. I think it's I'm I don't want to confuse my new title and this title. They're both like between 21 and 25 shops represented. And I felt like we did a really good job of covering those that, um, I'll talk about this in a minute, but are on the Ohio Ice Cream Trail, which is an established uh, to Ohio, is it Ohio dot? It's Ohio Tourism's website, um, and they have all these trails now. They have wine trails, they have a literary trail, and they have an ice cream trail. They also have a Buckeye trail, so we'll talk about that one too. Um, but I didn't want to be limited to that, and I wanted to cover folks that weren't necessarily participating in that for whatever reason. Um, and so, you know, really spent that time frame making sure that we had good coverage of those legacy stories, but also the modern makers. And there's some people doing some really cool stuff in the frozen confection space. Um, that you might not necessarily associate with being ice cream, but it is certainly has dairy lineage. And so we'll see a few of those modern makers here too. I don't know if anyone knows how many firsts associated with ice cream happened in Ohio or by Ohioans, but the ones that I was most surprised about are here. And so the ice cream cone has to take the cake, right? Like we would all still be just ordering the dish of ice cream were it not for the Menchies brothers. Has anyone heard of this group? They actually also invented the hamburger. Um, and so a lot of their notoriety comes and a lot of their ingenuity around the World's Fair. So the ice cream cone was invented, I'm gonna check my dates because I don't want to get it wrong, 1904, the St. Louis World's Fair. Um, and the story goes, this is you know, a little bit of controversial legend, but basically one of them was courting a young woman who was dressed to go to the fair. And back in the early 1900s, dressed to go to the fair, much more formal than I am here tonight. And so she wanted to try the ice cream, but she was very afraid of dirtying her garments. And they, uh, always thinking, had a waffle maker that they were doing another product on. So they took just a very thin amount of batter and they put it on the waffle maker. They only let it on for a minute or so and they took it off while it was still warm and they took, it's called a fid. It's the thing that holds a, a carnival tent or a fair tent into the ground. Hopefully they cleaned it off. They wrapped the waffle around it and let it cool, pulled it off and there she had the first ice cream cone. They put her ice cream in there and she didn't need to touch anything. They then took that idea back um, and, uh, and started um, making the machines to produce in larger quantity. And it actually was a gentleman at Ohio State that ended up automating the ice cream cone machine line. And so then you were able to mass produce even those uh, more cake-like cones versus the waffly type of cone, sugar cone versus cake cone. I think that's a regional thing, depends on what you call it. 
Um, the banana split has a, a similar lore. This was a gentleman in Wilmington. So if you head down towards Cincinnati, don't speed through Wilmington. But um, the other thing they're well known for besides their police officers is the banana split. They actually, pre-COVID, had a festival every year. Now, they haven't brought it back in its entirety yet, but I've heard they're doing a couple of things last summer and this summer to just celebrate this part of their history. Um, this was a restaurant called Hazards down in Wilmington, and he was really trying to bring in more college students. So he challenged all of his employees to come up with a grand dessert, something that could really be a showpiece of the menu. And people came up with different cakes and pies and things, and he said, no, 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 I don't like any of this, and scrapped all of their ideas. He went into the kitchen himself, he cut a banana down the middle, we all know where this is going by now, and he did his three scoops of ice cream, his three toppings, his whipped cream, nuts, and cherries, and he called it the banana split. And he lays claim to it. Now there is another town, I believe it's in Kansas, that hosts a banana split festival, and they also lay claim to it being created in a pharmacy around the same time. But we're gonna give it to Hazards because it's a book about Ohio ice cream. Um, and then everyone knows of the Good Humor Truck. The Good Humor Truck was invented in Youngstown, Ohio by Harry Burt and became not just, you know, maybe the precursor of the entire mobile food scene, um, but an icon and, and a legend that still lives on today in its brand and packaging. Um, one of the biggest things that he was able to do was put the freezer system, the refrigeration, on a mobile unit and start driving around town. And beyond that, he standardized the process so much for the staff. So their uniforms were very crisp, very you know, all white, very crisp, the little hats. But they also had to say certain things to customers. So every detail was in this handbook, and it became sort of a guideline for other uh, restaurants to train their people and other people in food operations about how we want to deal with the customer, how we want to invite them into the truck, not into the truck, but you know, into the process of the transaction and make sure that we're serving them in a way that is a really high quality. The other thing that they did interestingly, tying back to Chicago, is they started to franchise a little bit. And so there was a franchisee in the Chicago market that had a fleet of eight trucks and he was parked in sort of the South Lincoln Park neighborhood, what we know of at this time. And this is where Al Capone and his mobsters worked out of. And so one night there was a big mob brawl right outside in the good humor trucks. They, they sh shot them all up and there was like some other antics that were going on in that. But they were on the front page of the Chicago Tribune the next morning. And this is one of the ways that good humor got the most notoriety. They realized, okay, people are talking about the, us. We weren't involved in that chaos, but this is actually a good thing that our brand is out there. So they started parking their trucks out in LA outside of studio lots and that's how they got themselves in the background of like every movie in the time period from the 20s to the 40s you will find a good humor truck somewhere um, so just really smart savvy you know precursors to lots of marketing that we see today with branded extensions and whatnot uh, and then the last one we have here similar time frame so there's a lot going on in the early 20s with what we call novelties and there seems to be a little bit of a tug of war as to whether or not we want our ice cream on a stick so the Isley's company, which at the time was quite a large company, um, expanded outside of Ohio to, I believe, Michigan, Indiana, and I know Pennsylvania because their current owner is Conroy Foods. And so Isley's, in the extent of shops, doesn't exist anymore, but Conroy actually still produces their ice cream. And they have some very iconic flavors, um, things that you can't find uh, necessarily anymore. But the first thing that they were known for was the Klondike bar. And so the way that they, you know, that, that came about was they said, okay, well, you know, we like all these things, these popsicle-like things on a stick. In fact, the Good Humor Company ended up getting into a fight with the popsicle company over who had the stick patent first. Um, and Harry Burt's widow had to fight the popsicle company tooth and nail to basically just even get to use the stick. They, they ended up basically dividing the patent in two. Um, but meanwhile, the Isley's family is like, no, we don't want to stick at all. And they spend a lot of time figuring out how to come up with a chocolate coating that wouldn't just melt all over your hands. And then they did a lot of promotional things, and no one has been able to quite explain this to me, although there's a gentleman that's written two books on Isley. So if you want to dig in deeper, Brian uh, Butko is his last name, B-U-T-K-O. Um, but apparently, at some point, they were putting pink slips of paper, their pink coloring, in the middle of the Klondike bar. And if you got one of those, you brought it back and you got a free one next time. So no one's quite sure how this wasn't like something somebody choked on. Um, but apparently it was a successful promotion. Again, you know, just really the impetus of 
early marketing where you're figuring out how to differentiate your product from another. So even just taking the stick out wasn't enough. They wanted to have some kind of novelty promotion that you would come back to the store again and again. Um, so yeah, among other inventions um, which are in the book, these were you know, some of my top favorites because I think what would we do if we didn't have all those in the ice cream world? The other thing that was really fun to dig into was the, how many family-owned operations are within Ohio's ice cream royalty, if you will. And so you've got great representation from across the, straight, the state. I don't know if anyone's heard of all of these or not heard of some, but um, Aglamisi's Brothers is one down in the Cincinnati area. Their original parlor is in Oakley. And the gentleman who's running it now, he's actually He's the, the second generation, but his daughter's involved in the operation, so they kind of have a third generation going. His mom and dad went to New Orleans on their honeymoon, and they were so inspired by the architecture of the French Quarter that they came back and opened an ice cream shop, and everything, all the Sundays, even the look and feel of the ice cream parlor is very New Orleanian. It's like raw iron. Um, the Sundays are like the Royale Street instead of a normal banana Royale. And so they really just took inspiration. They also have a giant candy counter. So a lot of times in those days, people were doing both ice cream as well as chocolates. And I think they're one of the last ones that is still really keeping that up where both are handmade in store every single day and you can just really taste that quality. So that was a really fun favorite visit. And then you've got Young's Jersey Dairy on your way down um, to Yellow Springs. Obviously they've become a destination, not just for the ice cream, certainly for the cheese curds if you're there for that, but also for the attractions. You know, they've got the Jersey cows, they've got the goats you can feed. They've now got um, a, like a barrel ride, a train that the kids can go around in. They've got a mascot that dresses up and, and is at events. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And even during COVID, they built, they actually took their old parking lot and built a new building on it and then demolished their old building and made that the parking lot. Um, so it's a really cool place to visit. They didn't make their own ice cream for almost 50 years of their legacy. So they were they started off as a roadside stand. It was the honor system. You'd go in there and you know pay for your milk, whatever they were charging, get your cheese. Um, but the milk they would send to Borden's and that Borden's would make their ice cream and they would say, okay, you know we want these 30 flavors or whatever Borden's could do. But their hands were pretty tied around what they could do outside of what Borden's was already doing for some other customers. And so in the mid 80s, um, Dan and Ben Young, their cousins that currently run the business, decided to come up to OSU and they went to OSU Extension and they learned how to make ice cream. And they said, we're gonna take this all in house and we're gonna do it you know, over time. We're gonna make sure that we're confident in our abilities. And now everything is made on site and they're offering way more than 30 flavors. Dan's favorite story about one of the, the top selling flavors is that he had this employee that was nagging him, nagging him, nagging him. Dan, we gotta do cookie dough. And he's like, cookie dough in ice cream? That's gross, like that doesn't even make sense to me. And she's like, no, no, I've seen it places, it's getting popular. And he's like, oh my gosh, these, these teenagers and you know college kids that work there over the summer, and he's like, they're coming up with these crazy ideas, but they have an on-site bakery. They bake all their brownies, all their cookies, all the other things that they sell, they do there. And so he was like, all right, I mean, I guess we could try it. And they went back and they figured out how to do it eggless, because you can't, you obviously can't put, you know, the egg cookie or the egg cookie dough into the ice cream. And they figured out a way to do the cookie dough eggless. They mixed it into their normal vanilla ice cream. It is now in at least the top three sellers every single day at Young's Jersey Dairy. And she was like, Well, I told you so. So now he listens to the employees, he'll tell you. Um, and you know, I don't know, you guys could probably tell me more about Johnson's than I can tell you, your friends down the street here. Um, I'm not allowed to pick favorites. I joke that it's like picking children and uh, I, you know, I'm obviously not allowed to do that, though I also joke that on any given day I could tell you which child's my favorite. Um, it just goes day by day, every day it changes. But Johnson's is one of my favorites for a flavor they do that they have changed the name of on me. It used to be called Peanut Butter Chocolate Tornado. Anyone have this one? So a lot of people will do, a peanut butter base, like Jenny's does a peanut butter base, it used to be called the Buckeye State. They've since changed it to salted peanut butter with chocolate flex, very long name, similar to the Columbus Food Truck Cookbook. Um, but when they went out of the state, they were afraid people wouldn't know what the Buckeye State was, so they had to be very literal about what that flavor included. But that's a, a peanut butter base, and it has chocolate flex in it, obviously. 
What I love about what Johnson's does is it's a chocolate base and it has literally ribbons of this like hard crack peanut butter in it. And it is just so good. Now he stopped making it for a while and I had to tell Matt, I'm like, where's this flavor? When I interviewed him, I'm like, last question, we got all the family history out of the way. I need to know what happened to peanut butter chocolate tornado. And he's like, oh, we're really trying to bring it back. But apparently it was so hard to scoop because the peanut butter would freeze so hard that they had to just take it off the menu while they kind of tinkered and toyed with it to make sure that they could um, scoop it. And they used to package it in pints that I could buy at Wylands, but now they um, are only, it's a shop exclusive. So you have to go to New Albany or Dublin or, or visit you down the road here in Bexley for Johnson's, I think they just call it chocolate peanut butter now. Um, but the other interesting Chicago connection for Johnson's is that when I was living there, there was this shop called Bobtail. And it was about three blocks from my apartment, by far the best ice cream in that part of the city um, that I will lay claim to. And there was a, always a story that was up on the wall that I would read haphazardly while I was waiting for my ice cream. And it talked about how great grandpa Johnson started this ice cream business. And it never, I don't think it ever said, maybe it said Bexley, but not Ohio. And I didn't put two and two together because my husband from the Northwest area and we hadn't gotten back quite that much yet. And so finally I came back and I was like, this is the same ice cream. I swear this is the same ice cream place. So over the years, um, the Johnson's family had two cousins that went to Chicago and they wanted to open an ice cream business there using the grandpa's recipes. They didn't put it in the family name because they thought they'd just do their own thing while they were there. About five years ago, they left the business and Johnson's took it back over. And for a short period of time, they actually had an ice cream, a Johnson's ice, real ice cream uh, there in Chicago in the Lakeview neighborhood. Um, just recently, within the last year, maybe two at this point, they sold that actual space to an ice cream shop that started in the short north here called Creamed, it's C-R-M-D. And they were looking to find space in Chicago. Matt and company were looking to sort of get out of that business because they just wanted to be local here to Columbus. Um, so they literally just swapped names on the lease. It was like, oh, we're all from Columbus. We're just going to give you our Chicago ice cream shop, which was, I, I thought, pretty cool and a nice synergy. There's a lot of healthy, um, not competition, but like camaraderie amongst the, the different, especially these family owned generational businesses, you know, different members of their family have known each other literally for decades. And so when during COVID, the sugar prices went through the roof, they were all kind of on the phone to one another and they attend the same conferences and they see the same trends and they're saying, you know, what are you guys doing about this? Because we don't want to raise our prices, especially during COVID. We want to give people this little luxury, which ice cream sales went through the roof during the pandemic. It was like ice cream and wine. I'm writing a book about ice cream. My husband sells wine. It was a hilarious time. Um, and, and so, you know, they were kind of working together and really kind of finding ways that they could be creative. Um, I don't know that they went to the extent of like ordering in bulk together. I'm sure they all order in bulk anyways, but they were you know, having a lot of those conversations about how can we all be successful, not necessarily compete against one another, which I just found you know, inspiring. Very much like the mobile food scene. Those guys, it's crazy because they take their business on the road every day. And so the biggest tip, there's a section in the back of that book that talks about what, what you should do if you want to open your own food truck. And basically everyone says, be a mechanic or know a very good one. Because that's you know the crux of that business is that the truck breaks down all the time. Is there any uh, one on here that anyone wants me to talk about that anyone is or isn't familiar with that they have a question? If not, we can keep rolling through. And we can always come back to. I can't tell the story of every single one in one night or we would be here way past library closing. Um, so this is fun. This is where you have to participate, so get ready. This is called Famous Flavor Matchup. And on, I'm gonna double check here, yes, my left, all of your left, um, you've got the producer, so the name of the shop. And on the right, you have one of their most famous flavors. Anybody wanna take a, a stab? Just pick a producer and tell me which one you think belongs to them. Yes, Jenny's Salted Caramel's been an icon since Jenny's was actually Scream in the North Market. She had a business partner um, and they had a little stall there in the North Market. She was one of the original ones to caramelize and salt that caramel and take it to a deep, deep color. You'll see in the book, so one of the interesting things about um, Arcadia, if you're familiar with a lot of what Arcadia and the History Press do, it's those 
sort of sepia tone, black and whitish looking uh, history books. So when American Palette came around, at least from the history that I know of it, there was a push to do more color. And certainly with you know a cookbook, we wanted recipes to have color. But even with a book like this, you know, we eat ice cream with our eyes first, right? Hence my children ordering in their color preferences. So this is actually a picture of Jenny's making that salted caramel and the process that they go through painstaking, labor intensive for each little pint, but that's why it's become an icon. And now we have so many imitators. You're seeing Talenti do salted caramel. You're seeing, you know, the groceries, other grocery store brands really try, try to take on that profile. And, and you've got salted caramel everything, not just ice cream now. So good one, good, good start. Anybody else? Anyone familiar with Ritzy's? They were pretty big in the 80s, mid 80s to mid 90s. They actually grew like wildfire. So um, Gordon Ritzy is, it goes by GD, is uh, an ex-Wendy's guy. And so when he went out on his own, he wanted to create just a neighborhood hamburger and ice cream, hamburger and milkshake place. And they did really well. They grew really fast throughout the state. At one point, I believe they had over 40 locations. Um, and he'll tell you they just grew too fast. Uh, there were you know, a lot of growing pains that were happening. So the business actually closed down. They closed every single location in the late 90s. But before that, somehow People Magazine got word of their ice cream. And they called and they asked for samples. And they said, is this really People Magazine? Like, OK, sure, we'll send you samples. Sure enough, they got ranked the best chocolate in the country in 1983 by People Magazine. And so that flavor has been renamed 1983's Richest Chocolate. Gordon's sons brought back the business I always get this wrong because I live two blocks away, and I think it's been there forever at this point, but I think it's only about four, maybe five years ago, pre-pandemic, um, reopened one location of Ritzy's, and so it has now kind of made its comeback to the neighborhood. Grandparents are able to take you know, their grandchildren, their children, and their grandchildren, and now you've got three generations experiencing um, kind of just a very classic roadside neighborhood hamburger and milkshake place. So it's a fun rebirth story by the younger generation of the family. Um, so they're actually a second generation. They could be on the other slide too. The other one um, that's after Jenny's is Mason. So these guys are in the Ohio City area of Cleveland. And the owners, um, the wife is of Asian descent and the husband is not, I don't believe. but. She, he actually bought her an ice cream maker for her birthday one year. And she said, well, I love eating ice cream with you, but I don't want to make my own. So he, he took that as a challenge and said, OK, I'll make the ice cream. And he got really good at it. They were living in Los Angeles at the time. And they moved back to the Cleveland. And they were going to start this ice cream business. And they were doing sort of small pop-up events. And one of their first one was the Cleveland Asian American Festival. It is a huge festival. I believe they had 40,000 people on their first day of actually serving ice cream. So you know, go big or go home, right? And one of the flavors that they chose to do is, the, thankfully for my daughter who loves purple, is ube. If anyone's familiar with this, it's a Japanese root vegetable in similar profile to like a sweet potato um, is how you can kind of picture that. But obviously, when you're using that for ice cream, you're, using, you're sweetening it even more so. Um, so it has a really unique flavor profile. But one of the other great selling points is that it has a very highly Instagrammable color profile. And so they also do something called an egg waffle. And so this is on a certain kind of waffle machine where it actually bubbles up. It's called a bubble waffle, I believe, in some places, too. But you see how bright purple that is? Um, and then they did a partnership with another Cleveland bakery where they actually made a purple macaroon shell. And they were able to make an ice cream sandwich. So not your grandma's ice cream sandwich with the chocolate chip cookie and the vanilla. We've got an ube macaroon ice cream sandwich. So really, you know, just a fun, distinct uh, flavor and color for sure there. And then. The next one on the list is down in Cincinnati. I think it's in Westchester. It's called the Cone. Their flavor is actually directly opposite them. I didn't realize Mason's was too. Not intentional. Um, <laughs> I've given this presentation for a year now, and I just noticed that those two are direct lines. You have to have some easy ones, right? But the cone is orange vanilla swirl, because if you drive down to Westchester, there is no way you will miss this place. Quite literally, the shop is a giant ice cream cone with orange vanilla swirl on the top of it. This gentleman, his parents had owned an ice cream business, but he was thinking about getting into it himself. And he was down in Florida, and he found this building 
Um, and he was like, I have to buy this. It was not an ice cream shop at the time. And maybe it had been, but it wasn't functional. And so they drove this giant ice cream cone. Imagine a building-sized ice cream cone with orange vanilla swirl. They drove it up from Florida and parked it there in Westchester outside of Cincinnati. And it's, you know, an icon. Uh, very much a mom and pop summer seasonal shop. But the orange vanilla swirl is something that people go there directly for. Um, and then creamed, I mentioned in the short north. Uh, one of their f flavors is the Viet coffee. This is inspired by their travels through Vietnam and the Vietnamese coffee. But creamed, much like um, Mason's, I'm gonna hide little ladies for a second because we're not on their page, but cream does a lot with color. And so this is actually their color that they made for the, or their ice cream that they made for the Columbus crew. So it's actually black and gold. This is a cookies and cream flavor profile, but you never know it looking at it because it's black and gold. Um, they also do a lot with like, they actually have a charcoal gray ice cream. Uh, I think that is also a vanilla profile. And then they'll do like crazy sprinkles and cornflakes and just very unique types of um, all black background in the shop, so the ice cream really pops out. And the last one we have on here is Hartzler Family Dairy, and theirs is the Heifer Trails. Uh, that is essentially like a moose tracks, but replace, replace the moose with a cow and we've got the Heifer Trails. That's our flavor matchup. We've talked a little bit about, you know, the mom and pops and the must stops. Um, Zip Dip is another one with some really iconic imagery that they have a neon. They're down in Cincinnati area too. And um, if I can find their neon, it's really fun. You can see them from miles away. Um, they've got a cone as well as their neon. You can't miss that on a great summer night. Um, whip de doo recently opened in Mainville, and they are the only place outside of Kings Island where you can get that blue raspberry soft serve. If anyone's been down to Kings Island and had that, apparently people just go crazy for it. And so they were able to license that with the, with the park, and they're able to serve that same exact flavor at whip de doo um, the Dairy Hut is a Pataskala institution. The last family that owned it owned it for 40 years. They just passed the reins over in the last couple of years to a new family. They're a young farming family. They grew up in the area. They found out that the owners might be ready to retire and they said, okay, we have three little kids and a farm, but we're willing to take this on as, as, to make sure it doesn't close. They wanted to make sure it would always be part of the community. This place originally was a 10 by 10, and they would get three, four high schoolers in there in the summer, and it was a dance. And these kids would just know, you know, I go over here for a milkshake, I go over here for this flavor. Um, and so it's a, a really cool uh, thing that they've kept this legacy alive. They expanded the building just slightly. They modernized the brand a little bit, but they haven't changed a single recipe, especially the coney sauce, which people line up for about a mile on closing day to get the coney sauce in quartz so they can freeze it and get themselves through the winter when um, the dairy hut is not open. And then the last one I'll talk about on here is King Cone. And the reason I like to mention them is we're gonna see Little Ladies, which is a Columbus uh, base. They're actually, they're brick and mortars in Westerville, but they started as a truck. And so near and dear to my heart with the mobile food scene. But King Cone, if I can find her, is the sister of Little Ladies. And one of the unique things about this shop is they actually do what they call a hard pack ice cream. So if you know you were scooping from a gallon and they do a soft serve. And so you don't see that all the time, but when you have both combinations, you know, when people ask like, what's my favorite ice cream place? I always say, well, it depends on what I'm in the mood for. If I'm looking for a hard ice cream and you take me to Little Ladies, eh, it might not be my favorite that day. But if you take me to Little Ladies for soft serve, but I wanted Johnson's, you know, that's not gonna fit the bill either. So I love that they decided to just, they're gonna serve both and they're gonna do a quality version of both a hard pack ice cream and a soft serve. And they do some crazy things with their soft serve, but wait till you see Little Ladies because they do some even crazier, all homemade toppings and, and really fun stuff up there. And so we'll go to Little Ladies picture. They started as a truck. Um, it's an old USPS mail truck that the owner and her husband refitted from top to bottom. And they decided they're gonna do the highest quality soft serve they can. They only served on the truck, they only served vanilla originally and then vanilla and chocolate. And because of mobile food problems a lot, for a long time, they'd be like, sorry, no chocolate today because the, that part of the machine just wasn't working. Um, but what they really specialize in is unique Sunday combinations. They're all named. 
So for example, the, the um, little girls on there are Mabel and Ida, and that's their first two daughters. They had a third child afterwards, another little girl, and her name is Flannery. She only has a Sunday at the shop, but they said that Flannery got the first name Sunday when they opened the brick and mortar shop, because Mabel and Ida had already had their items on the truck. Um, and the other thing that they do that's really fun is they do sparkle sprinkles. And so their sprinkles are pink and blue for the girls, but then they have a gold leaf sprinkle in there. It will dye your hands like crazy crazy if you, uh, we have bags at our house, but um, they, they're doing all homemade toppings, unique flavor profiles, and they change the Sunday weekly in the summer. So you get really seasonal tastes of summer. She did a peach cobbler recently, a pineapple upside down cake, um, and other fun names uh, recently have been the Luella, uh, the Essie, the Ruby, the Goldie, and they all kind of represent the, the flavor of that. And so when you go onto their social media and you see like, oh, this is the one they're doing that week. They've actually done naming competitions too. The Bernadette is my favorite, and it's cold brew with brownies, hot fudge, and a potato chip on top. So yeah. Um, Simply Rolled is the one that I was mentioning earlier that is ice cream, but you almost may not think it's ice cream. So has anyone heard of Thai rolled ice cream? It's a really cool process where they have a reverse of a hot griddle, but it's a cold griddle. And so they have this uh, mixture that's a liquid mixture. And when they pour it on, it sets. And then they take a little spatula and they roll it across the griddle. And it turns into, this is hard to see from up here, but you guys are all welcome to grab a book and look afterwards. Um, but it's these little rolls and they stand them up on their end and then they can put toppings on top of that. The other crazy thing they do is an ice cream burrito talking about kids ordering in color. And then you cross section this and there's like sprinkles coming out of it and marshmallows coming out of it and rainbow who knows what coming out of it. Um, so, you know, these are the more modern makers because they're playing with tradition, not just in the way necessarily that Jenny's played with tradition by going outside of your typical flavor profiles, but they're playing with tradition in other ways where it's actually the delivery system for the ice cream is something that is new and different. And I think that just shows you that ice cream, you know, we feel like it's been around forever, but it's continuing to evolve, it's continuing to change. Indulgence Ice Cream and Charlotte and Olivia's are both direct to consumer businesses. They have no brick and mortar, they have no truck. You actually go on their social media account, you see what flavors are available, you place your order directly through a, a direct message, and then um, if you order a certain amount from Charlotte and Olivia's, they will actually just drop it off at your door. Otherwise, you can meet them at a farmer's market. I actually met the gentleman from Indulgence at the parking lot at the zoo. Uh, and I was like, this is a weird like side deal that we've got going on, like roll down your window, here's your ice cream. Um, but yeah, you know, so he actually has relationships now with a number of restaurants in town. La Tavola in Grandview has been a client of his for a long time. So you can definitely find his products there, but you can also just go direct to the source and, and get your ice cream. And they are able to also do a lot more customization and flavor because they're doing such small batches. I mentioned the Ohio Ice Cream Trail. I don't know if anyone has seen this map or maybe taken a tour. It's in the book. It's actually also, I should have mentioned this to you earlier if you were interested there, Miss, but we have some coloring sheets back there and it's on the back of the coloring sheet. Um, so the Ohio Ice Cream Trail was created really to honor this legacy of dairy production and how it has translated into ice cream makers in the state. Um, and you've got large populations in the three C's, but you've got good representation from some of those places that maybe you're passing by. One of my favorites that's not on the trail is right outside of Old Man's Cave. I tried so hard to get them into the book. Um, and they just, I don't think they have a phone number. They definitely do not have an email. They barely had social media. It was like somebody created a Yelp page just to put a pin for people who were hiking to find them. Um, but this is like the kind that, you know, the trail pays homage to. This place, I think they can do 300 flavors because they have something called flavor burst and it's soft serve but what they do is inject flavor around the outside so you could say I want chocolate peanut butter but I want chocolate mocha and they can do that combination of you both are getting chocolate but one has the coffee flavor and one has the peanut butter flavor they can do other crazy things like that you can say I want you know lime raspberry that would be one of my children and uh, they can they can make all those combinations so the trail continues to evolve new shops are added to the trail we did have one leave the trail in the year that we were writing the book so there represented in the book. Um, Sweet Moses was a soda fountain, like an old school soda fountain up in Cleveland. And they were closing down, but we really still wanted to capture their story. 
you know, it's, it's history, it's culinary history. So they are represented on this version of the trail, but I believe they will be either replaced or at, at least removed in the next version. And that's it, I've chattered on for long enough, but we've got at least 10 minutes for questions if anybody has any. He's got a mic, so you're gonna be official. <laughs> And if not, that's okay. I can tell you just a brief bit about Ohio Buckeye, but we'll, we'll let it go for a minute on a question. Yeah. You've looked into the history of ice creams. What do you see as the future? What changes do you think are coming next? Yeah, I think um, there's a big push towards um, alternatives, so non-dairy alternatives, and you're seeing a lot of diversity in that. You know, you're not, you started off with just kind of your frozen yogurts or your oat milks, um, but you're seeing that production ramp up and get a lot more sophisticated. Even Ben and Jerry's is doing non-dairy versions that are every bit as good as their dairy versions. Um, Jenny's does quite a bit in the dairy-free space at this point with a coconut milk base. Um, and it certainly lends a different note to the ice cream, but they've been able to pick and choose their flavors really specifically to not necessarily mask that, but really complement it. Um, one of my favorites there is called Texas Sheet Cake, and it's a dairy-free flavor. And I think it combines so well with the chocolate that you want that coconutty note to be there. Um, so I definitely think that you know some of the being inclusive to people's dietary concerns and needs and preferences. Um, when I sat down with Jenny, it was actually a really interesting conversation about the dairy-free line because she said, you know, they have a lot of customers that come in and, and they don't actually have issues with lactose. They can do dairy, but they are combining the two flavors and they might order. They do a lot of the trio. Um, they have multiple names for the different. You can go as large as you want, but most people get like a, a trio, and so you can combine flavors. And she said one of her favorites is the darkest chocolate, which has been you know an icon for her for a long time. The milkiest chocolate, and those are both full dairy flavors. And this Texas sheet cake, and it's the total chocolate lovers indulgence overload. Um, but they really work well together. The mouthfeel of those ice creams is such that you would not notice that one had dairy and one didn't. Um, so they've really worked hard on, on that. Uh, beyond that, you know, I think. We're seeing a little bit of a return to the concept of the ice cream man and the ice cream truck, and I don't want to be gender specific about that, but just this idea of coming to you instead of you going to them. Little Ladies has struck a really interesting balance. They used to be all event driven, or I shouldn't say event, but like all neighborhood driven, and they would just show up in a different neighborhood every night and hope that people knew they were there and came out. Now they are very much pivoting to be more event based, um, but every once in a while they'll be like, hey, we've got an open night on our schedule, where should we go? And social media, well, you know, whoever, whatever neighborhood raises the most hands, they'll go to them. Um, and so we don't necessarily have that childhood memory, or I don't think our, my children will, of the little song going around the neighborhood. Um, but maybe, maybe we'll get back to there. Um, and then the last thing would be that if you if you interpret ice cream broadly, we're seeing a lot of. Peletas, which is the Spanish word for popsicle, um, with really unique and distinct flavor variations. Um, and you're seeing them both as additions to that um, ethnicity of restaurant, but then you're seeing them stand alone now. And there's a great one, and I'm going to blank on its name, but it has multiple locations at this point. It has such a wide, diverse offering. Um, so I think a little bit more of the old but yet moving that forward and kind of and nostalgia's big right now, right? So uh, bringing kind of th those old things back in a way that feels more modern and feels more relevant um, and allows this generation to enjoy the same things that their parents and grandparents did. Yeah. So a tiny bit on Ohio Buckeye. Um, you guys are literally the first folks that not, not that are seeing the cover, but that can hold the book in your hands because I just got them on Friday. Um, I don't even think I'm supposed to have them yet. Are we still recording? Uh, <laughs> uh, but it comes out two weeks from today. And this book, similar format, so we went across the state and we looked at um, small producers to you know the kind of household name like Anthony Thomas, who is the official Buckeye of the Ohio State University. Um, really wanted to dig in on this idea that a Buckeye is not a Buckeye is not a Buckeye. Because on face value, I thought, oh, they were all just what my mother-in-law makes, right? Um, she actually got the dedication on this book because, not that I just had to spread it around to the moms, although that didn't hurt, um, but she makes 
She leads the charge in uh, the production for her church bazaar every year, and they make over 5,000 Buckeyes. They have a pre-order system where you can order them by the dozen, and they are sold out by about 10 a.m. on the day of the bazaar. So it is something people look forward to every year, and they know that the quality is going to be there. She's a perfectionist. She will tell you you have to close the hole. Um, this is a, a section in the book where we talk about do you close the hole, do you not close the hole. Uh, on the other hand, Bellbrook Chocolates, which is in Centerville, but they moved from Bellbrook and they kept their name, um, they insist on leaving it open, and that's the cover picture there, because they want you to know that they're handmade. And so it's kind of different when you're getting them from a shop. They want you to know that you know they hand dip them. Um, but it was really fun. The other cool thing about Bellbrook specifically is they some folks now are offering a milk chocolate Buckeye or a dark chocolate Buckeye. Bellbrook has a bespoke blend of chocolate. You can only get one type of chocolate at Bellbrook, but it is a mix of milk and dark chocolate. And it just makes it, you know, a really unique profile. And then you've got folks like the Buckeye Lady. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, Alicia Hinman and her business, a pandemic project. She wanted to help some of her restaurant uh, worker friends, and she wanted to kind of do something that could, you know, uh, offset their lack of income at the time. And so she started making Buckeyes, and it had always been something that she was good at, that she'd bring to parties, that friends and family said hers were the best. But her mom said, well, Alicia, you've got to do something a little different. Everybody makes Buckeyes. She said, why don't you put M&Ms in them? And she'd never seen a stuffed Buckeye. I mean, I don't know that anyone had seen a stuffed Buckeye before 2020. Uh, so there are now some, she'll call them copycats. I won't, because I included them in the book. So there are some other folks that were like, likewise inspired. Um, but that is actually a red velvet cheesecake Buckeye. So she's gone beyond M&M's, and she does like a cold brew espresso cream Buckeye. She's actually in Clintonville, very close to me as well. Um, and we'll be doing a segment together uh, on, on the launch day. Um, and so she's, you know, you go in there, and it's she's got your traditional Buckeye, but she's got about 20 other offerings of just various flavors and things that you might have never thought to put in a Buckeye. She did an everything bagel one once, oh. tying this back to ice cream. I don't know if anybody caught Jenny's everything bagel ice cream. They've done it multiple years now. It's got to be the most polarizing thing Jenny's <laughs> has ever done. People either absolutely love it or think it's maybe the most disgusting thing they've ever heard of. Um, I have had it. It has actual pieces of like bagel in it. Um, and it certainly has all the spices. But it works because if you get Jenny's cookbook, so I don't have recipes in the ice cream book, but you can get Jenny's cookbook. She's got multiple. Um, she, for the home cook, she actually recommends you use cream cheese as the base for your ice cream mm -hmm. to get that mouthfeel that's so iconic from Jenny's. And so the cream cheese works in the everything bagel ice cream. I, I think it's worth a shot if she brings it back and you're in the shop. <laughs> um, but yeah, so excited about Ohio Buckeye, making a bit of a transition. I'll still be talking about Ohio ice cream, uh, I think through September 7th is our last event for ice cream this season. And then we'll be doing some events for Ohio Buckeye in August, where we'll probably talk about both. But you know, hopefully this title will be pretty evergreen. Buckeyes are big in football season and through the holidays. And so excited to share the stories of those producers um, and the, the tiny controversy behind the origin of the Buckeye, which I'll, I'll let you read the book to find out. Ooh, yeah. Very nice. I think we had another, one more question here. Question. Yeah. How long did it take you to study the event of ice cream? So uh, thank you for that question. I did quite a bit of research at the Ohio History Connection, and they have a fantastic library um, for very, you know, um, I would say older topics that if you're looking to kind of research something like that, I don't know if that will go black for me, or if you want me to just put it back up. OK. Um, and so I would definitely recommend a visit there. They even had photos, and I believe they have the molds too. I didn't ask them to pull them out, of a place called Erlenbush and Sons, where this was at a time where ice cream was such a novelty, not to use the word that we now use for popsicles, but um, just such a rarity that they would mold ice cream for the holidays, and they would double freeze it. So they'd freeze it in these metal molds. They'd take it out, freeze it again, and then they would paint it, and they would paint Santa Claus, they would paint a Thanksgiving turkey, they would paint Easter bunnies and Easter eggs. And you know they were very special things because ice cream at that point wasn't uh, necessarily a little luxury. It was something that you, you had to spend quite a bit of money on because we didn't all have freezers in our homes and whatnot. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time at the Ohio History Connection in their library, all in from approval to release date, we were just under a year. Um, so green light to launch uh, was about 11, almost 11 and a half months. 
Ohio Buckeye took a similar amount of time. I think I got the green light within the, the same couple of weeks, early summer of last year. And we will launch in two weeks, only because we probably could have launched in May, uh, Ohio ice cream launched in May. But knowing that Buckeye season really starts you know, with football um, and then the holidays, we figured we'd focus on ice cream during those hot summer months. And we wouldn't let all the Buckeyes melt at all of our events until we get to the fall. So we'll, we'll still keep our fingers crossed that that happens. Thank you guys so much. You've been a great audience. I really appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you. And yeah, you can feel free to flip through books in the back. Um, and you know, if you are, are interested in taking a copy home, I'm happy to autograph them for you or write a message to someone. Or you can just grab coloring sheets and postcards to remember me by. And you can always find me on the usual suspects, as well as Gramercy across the street carries all the titles. So we want to support them. Yes, please buy some books. And then we also have, um, I have a- Oh yeah, she's got a I'm gonna, I have a raffle it. here for Johnson's gift card. Um, so the number is 696. 1439. Did you win? Oh, I love so much that you won. That is so you great. You go get the chocolate tornado. <laughs> They're all going to believe she rigged that. <laughs> that made it worth your parents dragging you here to sit for an hour. <laughs> you can get a few pints to take home now. Oh, I can unplug this. I have not.